Sierra Leone, like most countries in Africa, is rich in resources. Mining, particularly iron ore, diamonds and rutile, have led to economic growth in recent years. But despite its natural resources, 60% of Sierra Leone's population lives in poverty. And with a GDP per capita of around $500, it has relied for years on foreign aid. Sierra Leone is still recovering from a 10-year civil war that destroyed many of its institutions before ending in 2002. President Julius Madabio came to power in 2018. He promised to make his country financially independent by fighting against corruption. President Bio is a retired brigadier general in the Sierra Leone Army and was proclaimed head of state from January to March 1996 after leading a military coup that removed Captain Valentine Strasser from power. Bio moved to the United States shortly after that to study international affairs. Once he was back at home, he sought the leadership of the Sierra Leone People's Party, the SLPP. Now in power, once again, the challenges are many. The Ebola outbreaks of 2014 and 2015, before Biu came to power, had significantly damaged the economy. Now, like many leaders around the world, Biu's tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to fighting corruption, Improving literacy rates and life expectancy are also crucial. So after two years in office, is he succeeding? The president of Sierra Leone, Julius Madabio, talks to Al Jazeera. Julius Madabio, president of Sierra Leone, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Mr. President, Let's start with COVID-19, the pandemic that has shattered lives, rattled economies and put strains on the health services. We've seen a new pattern, which is basically infections increasing worldwide. Where does your country stand? Are you thinking about putting in place new restrictions? At the moment, no, because um, data and science tells us we are getting uh, very little cases at the moment. So we are very much on the watch. Uh, we have all the pillars supporting the response system in place, and we are alert. But at the moment, uh, we are not thinking about locking down at all. In fact, as a matter of fact, we have never really locked down as uh, others have done. Um, on two occasions, we had to do a three-day um, area-specific lockdowns so that we can uh, pursue certain uh, issues that we really wanted to to achieve at the time. Of course, as you know, what is happening around the world, there's an increase. And uh, since we are not experiencing that, we are very much trying to uh, go back to normalcy as much as we can. But we are very much on the watch because uh, COVID is around. Mm -hmm. So the quick, uh, quick economic recovery plan is meant to see how we can transition from um, the state of uh, COVID or post-COVID and carry on with uh, uh, creating a, a scenario for livelihood in this country. At the moment, um, we are really not experiencing many cases as it is the case around the world. The battle against COVID-19 brings back memories from your country's fight against Ebola in 2014 and 2015. What were the lessons you learned from that particular experience that was helpful to your country now as it tackles this pandemic? Well, that is a quick reaction. We heard about the pandemic and we went into action immediately. And using our experience with Ebola, we were able to uh, mount a preventive uh, structure to make sure that we could prevent the, uh, the advent of 
COVID in Sierra Leone. But of course, we knew we were fighting a losing battle because it was all over the world and part of being part of the international community, we knew it was going to come here. But uh, as we mounted the, the, the preventive measures, we were able to, to ward off uh, COVID for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, we were able to stand up the various structures. Luckily, we've had a very bitter experience from uh, Ebola, and uh, we had uh, still people in the system who had the expertise, who had the knowledge, and uh, we were able to put our national COVID response team together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so by the time we uh, on the 31st of um, March, when we had our very first case, we had uh, a, a strong structure that was ready to fight off uh, COVID. So this is how we've been able to keep it under control for, for a very large extent. Let's talk a little bit here about politics in your country, if you don't mind, Mr. President. When you came to power, there's been some sense of anxiety and instability, particularly when you set up the Commission of Inquiry into cases of corruption that took place from 2007 to 2018. That, that's when the All People's Congress, the APC, was in power. Many said that this was a pure act of political revenge against your opponents. Yes, but I think um, we have proven them wrong because um, what we did was to get um, uh, 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 people out of this country, judges who, who presided over the commission, uh, and they have, of course, um, shown that we did not interfere as a government. I did not interfere as, a, as, as head of state. We gave them the free hand to investigate and they produced a report. From that report, we have uh, uh, produced a white paper. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, we the political instability, I will not say there has been political instability. We've had corruption fighting back because once we took on the fight uh, against corruption, we knew it was going to fight back. Mm -hmm. And we are mentally prepared. I, in particular, was mentally prepared for that fight. But it is a fight that we must fight because uh, it's about the very soul of our country. Um, many would say we are poor. I would, I would disagree with that. I think corruption has been the enemy, and we are going. We had decided as an administration to attack corruption head on. So we are ready for, for the ramifications of our fight against corruption. This is the argument advanced by your opponents. They say that corruption is pervasive. It's not isolated. It's not about individuals. It's about the system that has been prevailing for many decades in. In, in your country, and you have been personally part of that political legacy of your country? Yes, there has to be a starting point, definitely. Um, normally, uh, I, I say the same thing the, to people. I say we have all been corrupt, but we have to draw the line. If we continue to be corrupt, um, we are not going to be able to have a better future for our children. We must accept that... Um, uh, uh, corruption is um, uh, pervasive in this country, and um, we have to. But we know how it has negatively impacted uh, the, the, our lives, our future, the future of this country. And um, as an administra uh, administration, I did say before, even I won, that I was going to attack um, corruption. So we are very much aware that it's everywhere in the country. But we are also aware that uh, the, the rate at which it has been going, the impunity with which uh, uh, corruption was, 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 was rampant in this country, and the, 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 it became fashionable, I would normally say. I wanted to make sure that we, can, uh, we, we should check corruption. I've been listening to you uh, in the past saying basically that it's about time for accountability and transparency. And I'm expecting to hear some transparency from you, Mr. President, as I'm going to ask you some few, few questions here. One of those questions are about when you were campaigning and saying that you had issues with your predecessor, Ernest Bay Koroma's ties with China, particularly the deals that was, that was chi uh, signed with China. What was your biggest concern about those deals? Is it there was no sense of transparency or because you thought the deals were with China were counterproductive to your country? Well, uh, I, I want to start by saying that China is a great friend of Sierra Leone, 
And uh, we had issues with transparency and the way the, the deals were, were structured. They were not in the best interest of the country. And uh, I did not attack the president. I attacked the particular deal, which was about Mamama, uh, an airport that was going to be mm -hmm. built. It was not going to be any, anything different from what we have now. If anything, it was going to be um, a, a smaller uh, airport with less facilities. So I, I stood against that because uh, we're talking about nearly 400 million United States dollars. So we, we still continue our friendship and uh, the bond of friendship with China. Uh, but I, that deal and few others, we are totally against. They are not in the best interest of the people of this country. And this, is, this explains why you decided there's absolutely no way you're going to go ahead with completing the project, which was basically the new airport outside of the, uh, of, of the capital. Is it because you were concerned that more loans could just end up being a debt trap for your country? Of course, that is one. And um, the way it was structured, there was no need for us to leave that airport where it is and build another one. Uh, we can uh, 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 refurbish what we have and uh, use it until, you know, when, maybe when we have a windfall and we can afford it, then do it and do it in a rather transparent way where everybody will get to know what is happening or what, uh, how the loan itself is structured. But here's the uh, thing here, Mr. President. Decades of instability and civil war have taken a heavy toll on the infrastructure of the country. We're talking about dams, roads, schools, uh, grid systems. To rebuild, you need cash. Investors don't seem to be willing to step in. The Russians said that they were willing to step in and, uh, and finance some of, those, uh, some of those projects. But you didn't seem to be really impressed saying that we need to look into everything into more details before we move forward. Well, I, I sit here with a national mandate and for the best interest of my nation. So when I look at any deal and I think it is not in the best interest of the people, I will reject that. Uh, I, we are open as a nation to investment, especially for infrastructure, because we know it's an enabler for development. But we are also conscious that uh, we should not uh, 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 take on loans that are not productive. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we make sure that the process of um, getting those loans are also transparent and in the best interest of our country. So we are not um, cherry picking. We just want to make sure that it is in the best interest of Saudi Mr. President, you know that your people will judge you in the future on the basis of what will you accomplish for them. And what baffles me and many people all over the world is how come Sierra Leone, a nation rich in diamonds and other natural resources, is at the same time one of the poorest nations on earth. That is the exact reason why we are here, to change that narrative. And uh, we are very active in the extractive sector, which you've just identified. Um, we, uh, Ali, I think uh, I did say to you that we are not a poor nation. We have been caught up in bad governance for a very long time. And uh, that is why you can, I, I, I think you can feel the passion in me for, uh, uh, for fighting corruption. Uh, these are the things that have hindered our development. And uh, with all the resources, if we do not um, uh, bring about reforms in the governance of our resources, mm -hmm. we are not going to be able to, to, to cater for the needs of our people. So as you can see, uh, one thing we have identified, resources, uh, mineral resources or natural resources, people say are very important. But to be able to effectively manage that, I think, for me, I have identified the human being, the human capital resource of our country as mm -hmm. the most important. And we have to develop that. And that is my priority project uh, as a government, human capital development. When you talk about the extraction processes that have to be implemented, are you thinking about restructuring the whole sector? Because I'll give you an idea about what's happening in your country, Mr. President, if you don't mind. It's so poorly organized, the diamond mining sector, to the point where you are famous for being the country where all it needs is just a shovel 
and a sieve. And there you go and try your luck. This does not work. You cannot move forward as a nation if you continue operating under this particular scheme. Well, that's why I told you that we are trying to sanitize uh, the extractive sector. We are rich. We have resources. Uh, beneath the, 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 earth, the, 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 the piece of um, uh, land that we sit on as a nation, there are a lot of resources. But we have, to, uh, we have to provide some guidance. We have to have sound policies on how uh, we extract these and uh, use them for the purpose of developing our nation, taking care of the social programs. So wh when I mentioned earlier uh, human capital development, already we have free quality education. We are paying for over two, uh, 2 2.5 million kids in this country because uh, as much as the resources are there, we can talk about diamonds and everything on earth, the human resource uh, capacity of this country has to be developed. So we are very much engaged. It is a total um, a, a revamp of uh, that extractive sector in mm -hmm. order to be able to get the benefits. Uh, this we have not done in the past, and that is why it is taken. And there are so many interests in and out of the country. So it is always difficult to, 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 to restructure that uh, sector. Speaking of those interests, are we likely to see a zero tolerance when it comes to the international trade trading companies which are more interested in their own interests, while at the same time they might be willing to manipulate the system for more revenues at the expense of the Sierra Leoneans? Of course, uh, there are companies, international uh, uh, corporate organizations that come in with um, and invest. We expect that they should have returns on their investment. But we also know that uh, in the process of um, exploiting those resources, that there is damage to the ecology and the environment, and uh, that we should have enough to cater for the communities where the activi these activities are taking place. And also for the nation, we need resources to be able to um, revenue uh, to be able mm -hmm. to take care of the many things that we want to do to improve on the lot of our people. But again, the potential is there. And again, with other sectors like agriculture, which, is, which was supposed to be uh, a key economic uh, sector, why is it lagging far behind? For the very reason that we have spoken about, uh, bad governance. And as I speak to you, it's one of those sectors. When I uh, spoke about human capital development, in Sierra Leone, when we talk about human capital development, we are talking about the agriculture sector, food security, uh, and uh, uh, education and health. Mm -hmm. So uh, th these are exactly the three areas we are, of course, attending to other issues of government. But in the areas of agriculture, education, and health, we are placing a lot of premium on that. And we know that, I have said to the mm -hmm. people of this country, that we should be uh, exporters uh, very soon. And we are, working on the, we, we, we are working on a policy shift to make sure that we, should, we can produce enough for Sierra Leone and even export. Food security is clearly on our mind. When you read reports of international organizations like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, which basically predict that your economic growth of your country will contract by something like 4%, and that inflation will continue to hover around 16%, plus uh, more than 50% of the population which lives below the poverty line. Doesn't this look a grim reminder of what might happen in the near future. You seem to be facing an unprecedented, massive challenge ahead. These are definitely uh, very difficult uh, scenarios uh, you've just spoken about. But we are also determined to make sure that um, we are putting in place sound policies, uh, shifting away from um, policies that have not paid off uh, from the past and making sure that we can uh, the, the, the inflation, uh, we have been reducing consistently, as a matter of fact. Um, I mean, corruption, you might have heard. Uh, when I took over, it was in the region of 49%, uh, uh, according to the rating by the MCC. Mm -hmm. Now we can talk about 81%. So it is not going to be um, an easy job. I don't expect that. 
But I'm very optimistic, and we are determined. And I want I, I'm sharing that optimism, and uh, uh, with the people of this country, that only we Sierra Leoneans can change the fate of this country. And that is why um, I remain optimistic because our people are beginning to buy into that, and we are going to fight the force as we have always done in the many instances where the nation has been faced with very serious challenges. And you seem also to be willing to somehow change the stereotypes that have been going on for quite some time about the, your country. Those images of young uh, fighters roaming the streets of the capital and elsewhere pillaging villages. And uh, to do that, you said that two things need to happen. First of all, education, and, and number two, uh, the gender gap in your country. Can you give us an idea about uh, how, how, how do you think you can move forward when it comes to those two uh, important issues? Education and gender. Yeah. Um, we have taken uh, the education, as I've said many times in this interview, uh, as the main thrust of our government. Um, we have uh, declared three quality education, wherein all, all kids from pre-primary to, pre to end of secondary school, uh, we go to school uh, at the cost of government. It is not free. We pay for everything uh, from learning materials to tuition to uh, teaching materials, and we are even providing food in some instances. Uh, that is to make sure that everybody goes to school. We know the benefit of education. Uh, for the guys who have been um, disadvantaged for a very long time because of culture and neglect, um, we have also been doing quite a lot in that area. Uh, sexual and gender-based violence uh, we have taken on. We have very strict laws now and uh, punishment for those who engage in um, uh, um, rape. Uh, it became, and I had even had to declare a state of emergency uh, for rape uh, last year. And we have put in place more efforts to just handle that. Uh, girls now have safe uh, 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 places in school to to be able to to take part in in education and not to fear. Uh, my wife has been involved in um, a campaign to make sure that uh, the girl child is free you know, from early marriage, uh, from rape. Uh, she is even providing um, a sanitary path because we realize that uh, the girls can lose up to uh, 70 to 80 days, uh, for, uh, um, um, days from going to school because they lack sanitary paths. And a lot of, we have taken up the, the, the issue of the guard child very seriously. And the nation is, catch, is catching up on that. So, um, these are things we take very seriously. Um, the issue about marauding gangs, you know, young men, that is history. We have settled, uh, you know, uh, we have had uh, a peaceful settlement of uh, the conflicts we have. And then, um, uh, interestingly, we are just about setting up a commission, peace and national cohesion commission, to keep a keen eye on just making sure that all issues that can instigate conflict of whatever nature are kept under control. When you look at neighboring countries where there's been uh, more instability, particularly in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Ivory Coast, uh, and where people have become pretty much worried about the potential for military hunters to take over once again, uh, what, what kind of message would you, would you like to send to those uh, people? The, 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 the situation of different countries vary. And um, what leads to military coup in one country may be different or similar. Um, the, 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 those uh, specific situations uh, leading to coups again in Africa um, are things that we need to look at very properly. You know, the, I'm, a, I'm a civilian now, and um, I therefore I speak as a civilian. Uh, we should not get the military involved in what should be a civilian affairs. But the military is also part of the country. The military will also suffer when there is bad governance. We also suffer when the civilian leadership is not doing what it's supposed to do. Are you confident at this particular stage that Sierra Leone has turned the chapter of military coups? Yes. We have decided as a nation that 
we are going to pursue the democratic path, um, irrespective of what is happening around the world. Uh, we know that um, uh, the, the, the space for politics, when it is, it is restricted, creates the possibility for military coups and other uh, 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 social upheavals. So what we have done is a, a collective determination as a nation that we we pursue the democratic path, and um, we've had uh, four peaceful transitions. I have always been seeking the interest of the people of the country. I joined the military to to uh, to fight for my nation, but. Even when I was involved in the military coup, it was for the best interest of this nation. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Julius Madabi, your president of Sierra Leone. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. Thank you very much.